I just want to give you a little background about the center and what we do, and then uh, use that as the lead into the conversation we're going to have tonight. So the center was founded about 10 years ago, and it was based on uh, actually work that I had begun trying to understand, if you will, the value proposition of kindness and compassion. And I know that may seem like a strange thing to wonder about, but I think as you can see in our present political environment, it's probably a good thing to wonder about. Uh, but this led to me really trying to understand what is it about us as humans that really is within us to do good and to care for the other. And in fact, the reality is this is our default mode. Oftentimes in modern society, though, we don't appreciate that. And when we are able to be kind and compassionate, especially with ourselves, uh, then it's so much easier to live in this world. And uh, I began this, uh, these research inquiries, and when I first had these conversations with some scientists, at that time, the study of compassion as a rigorous academic uh, uh, exercise was actually uh, not appreciated. And in fact, many people were told if they were going to research this, this was a dead end for having an academic career, which is really unfortunate. And in fact, there was so much disinterest initially that when I tried to reach out to some scientists, the only way that I finally convinced them to work with me was because I research, I paid for the research that we were doing. And if you know scientists and academics, if you pay for the research, they will do it. And the extraordinary thing about that, though, is after us working together for several months, two of those individuals changed their research focus to this area. So from that, though, what is very strange is that I was walking through the campus one day, and I'd begun this research work, and I saw how powerful it was, potentially, and I had a vision of the Dalai Lama. And I have to tell you that I was not a follower of the Dalai Lama in any way, shape, or form. And in fact, my wife was, and I would give her a hard time about this, and she would sign up for events, and I would drop her off and leave. Okay. Now, obviously, my wife was much smarter than I was. But this image of the Dalai Lama stayed in my mind, and suddenly, I felt that I had to invite him to Stanford to come and speak. And, uh, and I ended up doing that. We met. At the end of our conversation, he spontaneously gave uh, a donation for uh, promotion of this work. And that ended up being the largest donation he'd ever made at that time to a non-Tibetan cause. And it was so humbling and moving. And then right after that, two individuals came forth and gave significant donations, and that's how our center was founded. And what's Extraordinary, the last 10 years, we have been contributors to this movement of validating the value proposition of kindness and compassion in regard to our health, our wellness, and ultimately our longevity. And just this month, for any of you who are interested, uh, the Oxford Handbook of Compassion Science has just been released. Uh, I'm the senior editor, and two of our faculty here uh, are co-editors with me. And this is really uh, a summation of all the latest research in this area, so I'm very proud of that. For those of you who've come to Stanford and seek care before us for some of our talks, in addition to research, we also have uh, seminars, conferences. We sponsor two lectureships. And the thing I enjoy the most is this event. And this event is called A Conversation on Compassion. And I have been blessed uh, to have uh, really some of the most profound uh, spiritual, religious leaders, philosophers, and individuals who understand how looking into yourself and seeing who you are and giving yourself the freedom to be who you are changes your life. 
And we've had Eckhart Tolle, the Dalai Lama, Thich Nhat Hanh, Amma, a variety of individuals. And every time it's been quite extraordinary. And I really believe tonight is going to be just as extraordinary. It's really my great pleasure and honor to have two individuals with me who each of them are extraordinary individuals. And they are the authors of this book, A Mind at Home with Itself. Uh, how many of you are familiar with Katie's work? <laughs> and uh, to her right is her husband, uh, Stephen Mitchell, who uh, many of you also may know of his extraordinary translations. Uh, he's a co-author of this book and has also co-authored other books with his wife, Katie. And really, together, uh, they offer us incredible perspectives on this idea of self-realization and self-inquiry. And we're going to talk about that today from the perspective of not only the work, but from the Diamond Sutra. And, uh, and so we're going to talk about that a little bit. And I think Katie is going to then lead us few, through some exercises with the work a little further along the way. So without further ado, uh, we're going to begin our conversation, if that's OK with you guys. And again, thank you so much uh, for being with us. Jan. Hello, my dear. <laughs> um, compassion. Compassion. Uh, but before we can truly have compassion, I think we have to um, understand what causes us to suffer and uh, how that can sometimes prevent us from being compassionate. But maybe before we begin, I can just ask you a couple questions, and I know you've talked about it in your book and elsewhere, but I think it's always good to understand someone's backstory. Because for many of us, it is our backstory that is our story. And it leads us to what we do, uh, both good and bad. And once we understand uh, the backstory that brought us where we are today, it uh, actually can enlighten us about possibilities uh, for the future. So maybe, Katie, you could tell us a little bit first about how you ended up being Byron Katie of the work and Byron Katie before your, if you will, transformation and self-realization. Well, short version, uh, a lot of suffering, a lot of depression, very deep depression for more than a decade. And I thought I had to die. I thought I was very suicidal. I, I thought I had to die to escape it. And I didn't know there was another way. I, no one had ever told me there was another way. I don't have a religious background. Um, and um, sometimes the pain, it was difficult to even breathe through it. And one day, as I lay sleeping on the floor, you know, we, we spoke earlier, uh, we, we touched on, on what that's like, this lack of self-compassion. But as I lay sleeping on the floor, actually a cockroach crawled over my foot. I was sleeping beside my bed because I was so full of lack of self-compassion, so full of self-loathing, I didn't believe I deserved a bed to sleep in. That's depressed. So um, as this bug crawled over my foot, I opened my eyes. And in place of all that darkness was a joy that, that I can't put words to. But the important thing in that moment is I saw that when I believed my thoughts, I suffered. It was so clear. I experienced it. So clearly, when I believed my thoughts, I suffered. It was shown to me. I experienced it. And when I didn't believe my thoughts, I didn't suffer. And then I began to laugh. It was the theme that came out. It was like I got the joke. The whole thing was a joke, and I got it. I was just tapped into 
what is true. And, and then I, I stood, and the way I would tell it originally is, there was, because there was such a lack of identification there, it was like it stood up, it walked into a bathroom, it looked in the mirror and, and at the eyes in the mirror, and, and it, it's, it's like something, something happened. It's like um, uh, there was a transference of, of uh, what I saw there, which was the lack of compassion. I mean, it was compassion itself. In other words, the lack of compassion was gone. So that's a background. I was um, a mother trying to pay her bills and raise her children and, and um, very lost. In some ways, and I know you don't put it in the context per se of there is no self, so microphone. No, I did that on purpose. <laughs> I just want to see if you were listening. Uh, we talk about no self sometimes, and we sometimes use Buddhist uh, ideas related to this. Maybe Stephen, I know you're a Zen Buddhist and very familiar with this. This idea of understanding how your own thoughts uh, create this type of suffering. Can you put that in, in the phraseology, perhaps, of how it's looked at in Buddhist philosophy? Well, one of the, <clears throat> one of the, th uh, the uh, fundamental truths that the Buddha enunciated uh, the, about the, th the characteristics of every thing in existence, uh, impermanence and unsatisfactoriness, and the lack of a self. So, so it's that third thing, um, anatta in, in the Buddhist terminology, that Katie woke up, woke up to. And this is not a spiritual concept. Anybody who has done any uh, extended meditation will be able to uh, witness the fact that the, as, as much as you look for any kind of entity, that could be called a self, you cannot find it. There's no such thing in reality. And what I, one of the things I love among many things about Katie's story, because it's so, so, so much the essential awakening story, is that after she had that electrifying moment of vision and laughter, there were weeks, maybe months that went by when she could not utter the word I, the, the word that stands for a self in most languages, because it felt like a betrayal of her integrity. So as she tells it, instead of saying, uh, I want a glass of water, she would have to circumlocute in the way, for instance, it thinks it wants a glass of water now. <laughs> And uh, she couldn't say table and chair because they were lies. In, in reality, there's no such thing as nouns and verbs to separate things that are just one thing. So it, without any teacher, without any spiritual background, there was nothing to guide her but her own reference to her experience and her own integrity. And I love hearing about that process of what, what it's like for someone with uh, no spiritual background, um, no university education, only a wonderful American sense of what is true for me to guide her. And uh, so that's, it's, it's, and one of the things I love about this book is that, um, profound truths, profound, life-changing, uh, dramatically beautiful truths that may sound a bit abstract in Buddhist language, even with a text as, as riveting as the Diamond Sutra, are given blood and bones and, uh, and, uh, and embodied life through the stories of how Katie stumbled into relearning or, or in her terms, learning how to be human. 
after this experience. And this is what I was going to ask you about, Katie. Maybe you could just tell us a little bit more about that because, you know, reading the book, it's really quite profound because it's like you're a, a baby now born into the world and you have to sort of be guided and learn things again. And in some ways it's like a sudden deconstruction followed by the process of rebirth and... Yeah, the reconstruction. Yeah. Yeah, reconstruction. Um, you know, and it, it was, um, it was, you know, you can't make something live that doesn't live. You know, a false self, you can't make that live, it's false. But to speak out of it, you know, is quite a trick and we're all doing it. So to question as an identity, to question, to identify and question what you're thinking and believing identity begins to fall away like a like you know how a snake it will just lose its skin and it's it's just it, it falls away so it's not so frightening and radical and as time is also a construct of mind it's um inquiry gives us it, it holds us, so it's not so radical. We don't have to just go from this to that. And, um, and everyone's done the process I've done. When we wake up, it's, it's like if you, if you get really still and identify your oldest memory, the oldest memory that you can identify, the next time you're meditating, just be there in that. And then notice where you are in that first memory and notice what you're wearing and notice who's there with you and, and, and then notice just prior to, and notice how okay you are. And then notice just prior to that, who are you? What are you? Just prior to first memory. And then go to your second oldest memory and you'll never know if it's your second oldest or your first oldest or not, just the one that you can recall because that's the one that matters. And then you look at the second memory and you look, maybe there are like four years between one and the other, maybe two years, but who or what were you in between? And it's, an, it's, it's, it's a beautiful way to just just um, know <laughs> what comes to me right now. It's a beautiful way to just know you're always okay other than what you're thinking and believing. There's never been a bad moment. Collect your bad moments. Identify them. The worst things that ever happened to you. And other than what you were thinking and, me and believing, just meditate on that. Just notice other than what you're thinking and believing. Aren't you good? Isn't life good? Life is a gift, but what we believe about life, ourselves, each other, the world, now that could use a little work. <laughs> and of course, that's my invitation. I'm really clear about my job and what it is. It's interesting because, uh, and maybe you can comment on this, uh, Stephen, uh, people go out to seek truth or they go out and they find a practice that they think is going to answer the questions for them and they'll spend years and years in some sort of a practice yet they may not even barely be inching to the right place and the thing that I find fascinating is that on the one hand we see people who are using certain types of practices and it could be uh, Buddhist practice even, or even other religious practices, but they're not getting them to the place because I think one of the challenges is many of us are looking for that external thing 
that says we're okay and we're happy, and I think this is maybe where the problem lies, is uh, happiness being okay can only be given to you by yourself. As somebody coming from a, a very old tradition, I mean, two, two different old traditions, the Jewish and the, 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 the Zen Buddhist, one of the things I immediately found <clears throat> compelling and really brilliant about Katie's process of the work <clears throat> is that it's, it's so simple, the directions are, are so easy to practice. You identify a thought that's been troubling you, you write it down, and that's a huge distinction from traditional meditative practices. And then thought by thought, <clears throat> you, you inquire, and the possibility of looking elsewhere isn't even there. You're just alone with yourself, with your own most um, crazy or troubling thought, and, and there is only that thought in the universe at that moment. And when you start to <clears throat> see whether it's true for you or not, when you start to trace the cause and effect of believing that thought in great detail, I mean, this is a beautiful part of the practice, and then when you, through uh, the fourth question of the work, wh who or what would I be without the thought, when you start to live yourself into the imaginative space of that exact same troubling or mortifying or disappointing situation, without the filter of that thought, you can actually live it again. You can, you can um, see the world as it is just as it is, without any judgment standing between you and reality. And also, that's, that's the, that is where compassion is just a natural effect of just sitting in what you've been, what you've been describing. Self-compassion, compassion for the, for the whole human race. It's just like a domino thing. It's waking up to reality, the reality of our true nature. Yeah, it's, it's, it's part of the process, so you don't have to do anything to get to the compassion. It's just there once you disentangle these wildly inaccurate um, impositions onto reality. So, in a sense, um, the process of the work, at least in my experience, um, cuts out these dead ends of trying to, you know, become Buddha-like or you know, be like somebody that you much admire. It's, it's, that, that's not productive in my experience. Trying to be like what, it look, what we think it looks like. Yeah, that, yeah. Lead, that often leads to more suffering because, you know... I like uh, to say it, it works until you get the parking ticket. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And it, it sort of fascinates me because when we were talking about your self-reconstructing, there is, though, a, a difference between this work you're doing on yourself, or maybe uh, it just... What, what, yeah, what I'm thinking and believing. Right. Yeah. To get to the point of the creation of the work, were there iterations of that? Were there paths where you're, you're, you said, no, that's not what I, it is. Or was it immediately an awareness of this idea that what you believe is true? Actually, it, it was experiential. I was on the floor, the bug crawled over my foot, and I opened my eyes and, and I have to say, you know, going back, it was like it opened its eyes because there was no self there. No identification of self or anything. And it was like a witness. It's where the fourth question came from. And then all of a sudden, there was a window. And, be and then there, I could see through the window there was a sky and clouds, and then there was the bed, and, 
And that's when I began to laugh because prior to believing and naming and the image, it didn't exist. So that's all four questions and then what I call, you know, the, the opposites. It's, um, is it true? Is the joke I got, you know, no. You understand? It wasn't there. I believed it into existence, just like your first memory. I gave it identification. So how can the world appear just because I believe it to be? And that is where the world comes from. You know, you believed it in. So don't believe me, test it for yourself. So, um, and then I saw that um, how I reacted when I believed the thought it created the world, you know, my world, no matter how small it was there, and, um, and who I would be without it, that was prior to believing onto what we see as things. And that, that's all four questions in the turnaround. So those of you that aren't familiar with the work, the first question is, 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 is it true? Is what you're believing true? And uh, let's say an, an, an assumption that would, that would create that lack of compassion in us, like um, there's something wrong with me, or uh, I did it wrong, or um, I'm unacceptable. You know, so just to, to take one of those, like I did it wrong, and just close your eyes and meditate on is it true? as you witness that situation where you believe you did it wrong, maybe you, you tripped and fell in, a bunch of, in front of a bunch of people and you were just mortified. So you did it wrong, is it true? And just meditate on that and witness that moment in time in your mind's eye. And you may, you, you, you may there's so much to see in that. For example, did you do it on purpose? Did you think, I think I'll fall now? <laughs> I mean, do you have to take credit for everything? <laughs> what, I fell me? So just that first question can open your mind to your innocence. And that's the place where compassion is, it's, it's, it's born in it. And, and, and then, the next question, notice how you react when you believe the thought. You know, basically you have trouble facing those people again. Basically, you don't like yourself. You blame yourself. I mean, if you sit in that and see how you react when you believe the thought, you'll see what I saw on the floor. And who would you be without the thought? You'd enjoy the fall. How do I know the ground needs a kiss? I'm kissing it. <laughs> no mistake. No mistake in the world. You know, um, a few nights ago, I was walking toward the end of, a sta of the stage, and, um, and I got a little close, and I, I, was, I kind of did this thing and enjoyed it. <laughs> and the people in the front row went <gasps> like that to catch me. And what happened was they saw me falling before I was, they saw me falling and I didn't fall. So as loving human beings, you know, they jump up to catch me, but was that me they were jumping up to catch? That was false identification. They see, they see a woman falling, but that's not me. You understand? So it's kind and we do it, but it's just so beautiful to know the difference between what is real and what is imagination. And don't stop catching people. You know, that's not the point. But just to understand how the mind works and, and that there is a way to question it. And of course, some of you that know me know I always have to say anything, anything that you hear here that, um, that you want to know more about, anything I have of value is 
always free on the work.com. You don't have to sign up for a newsletter. You just go there and it's free. And I, I believe everyone has a right to know how to question their life and what they're believing about their life and the lives of um, themselves, others, and the world, what we think and believe about that. So that's, um, that's um, where the work was born. You know, it's interesting you make the comment of uh, don't just accept what I say. And yes. I think uh, this is also a tenet of Buddhism. You, it's an experiential or experiential. And, uh, uh, and the Buddha said, uh, and I want you to know I'm not a Buddhist. I just like to talk about these things sometimes. Uh, 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 you support what's beautiful. <laughs> well, thank you, thank you. But uh, it's this idea of experiencing it yourself and then know, because that's when you truly know. When you experience it, it has an effect. And as I was actually driving over, uh, I was thinking about uh, situations on more than one occasion where I've carried a thought about something I've done and it it's not even on my mind on a conscious level how I've attached an emotion to it. And it actually was quite amazing because I was thinking about a few of these things. Uh, and by the time I got here, I had let it go. And it was really, I, I mean, it, uh, I, I thank you. I mean, it was really uh, amazing for me. And, uh, and it just shows you how this opportunity is a gift we can really give ourselves, but so often we just need somebody to sh sort of light the way. And I think uh, your light that uh, has helped so many people. Uh, Stephen, maybe you can talk about the Diamond Sutra and the interaction here just a little bit uh, uh, to, because the book is in some ways a, a conversation and it intertwines these in an extraordinarily beautiful way. And we're talking about compassion, but the other component of this, when you can truly be compassionate, first you have to be compassionate to yourself, but then you can open your heart and be compassionate, and then that manifests generosity. And maybe... Yeah, exactly. <clears throat> that's, that's, the Diamond Sutra is a book about generosity. And um, the central insight of the sutra, sutra means scripture. Uh, it's a scripture that dates from about 350 of the common era. And the central insight is that the more deeply you understand that there's no such thing as a self. In other words, there's no separation in reality between self and other. So that the more compassionate you are towards something that doesn't even exist, the more compassionate you are, period, because there's no difference between giving to the other and giving to the self. And we all, I think many of us anyway, have that experience of spontaneous generosity to our children, for example, or to even to a stranger, where if, some, if someone came along witnessing that act and said, oh, how wonderfully generous you are, it would, we would do a double take. At first, it wouldn't even occur to us that we were being gen generous. It's just what we do. Um, so, so the sutra, uh, is a, is a set of, uh, is really a theme and a set of variations on that central truth. Um, it's famous in Zen circles because uh, one of the great early Zen masters, when he was an illiterate uh, woodcutter, heard a monk in front of a store that he was delivering wood to recite the sutra. And when the monk came to the, to the line, develop a mind that abides nowhere. When this illiterate young woodcutter heard that line, he, his mind shot open in, one, in an experience that the Buddhists call awakening or enlightenment. And um, so, so the book, A Mind at Home with Itself, is, is based on a dialogue between, a fictional dialogue between a fictional Buddha and his fictional student. And then there's a dialogue between Katie's reaction 
to the sutra and the sutra itself, and a, a third level of dialogue between uh, the chapters of her commentary and sections of questions and answers from a generic, a generically confused uh, reader, let's say. So it, it's an interesting play in many ways, but um, when I had the idea of doing the book in response to a lot of uh, questions about when will the next Katie book be coming, this seemed to me a perfect um, structure uh, for, her th for her insights because um, it's so intimately close with the work, with what, where the work brings people to that sense of, um, that sense beyond troubling thoughts where we all are perfectly generous because we no longer have a self to protect or defend. And that's one of the things I really loved about the book is this intertwining of this idea. And in some ways, the language between the two is different, but in so many ways, it's the same in how you look at it. Uh, uh, and maybe you could just talk a little bit more, Katie, about this idea, because I, I think it's really critically important, this idea of, is it true, but how we construct narratives that are so painful for us? Well, you know, I just heard Stephen say, develop a mind that abides, abides nowhere. Okay, so, so if you look, if you look back at maybe breakfast this morning or a walk this morning or coming to going to work this morning, and then you see you leaving here in the future and going home, are those? They're somewhere. They're two somewhere. Yeah, but are those really? places you see the 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 those false selves in other words not i those images of you yesterday tomorrow that's really nowhere isn't it it's no real place so to develop a mind that dwells nowhere is to be present. Now, how do you do that? It is not to lose those images of, of, of yesterday and tomorrow, but just be aware that you're nowhere. Those aren't <laughs> develop a mind <coughs> that dwells nowhere. That's past future isn't it. So just being present and awake to that is nowhere. And I think one of the things that happens for so many of us is when we're talking about the present and the future is the thing that, I mean, uh, the past and the future is the fact that we have such emotional connection to both of those mm -hmm. and we're there and we're not here. And I think that's really... And this is where depression comes from, you know, dwelling nowhere. You know, I see me in the past, I see me locked in my bedroom, agoraphobic. I see the terror of my family wanting me to leave my bedroom, my home. You know, I see that. And if I weren't awake to it, I might be very, very afraid that that would happen again. And so it does happen again. That's what <laughs> it is happening in the moment of the, in, in the presence of fear. So those images are very powerful, but to understand that that's not I, and the work gives us that. We, it's, it's, 
it is experiential, and it's nothing we're telling ourselves, it's a noticing. It's just to notice, and you know, the work is meditation, it's a practice. And um, when meditators, often when meditators are still, the mind that comes in to disturb that silence, we move aside. But what if you didn't move it aside? What if that thing you don't want to think comes in and you simply jotted it down? That's an honoring, that's respectful. It doesn't say, go away. It doesn't try to get rid of. I haven't met a thought I haven't loved in 30 years. <laughs> you know, I can't, if I don't love my thoughts, I can't love you. This has to be dealt with first because you are who I believe you to be. So an inquiring mind can just break all of that apart and leave you as you're, you know, with more awareness. There is no way that I'm aware of that I could ever be de depressed again. And I would want that for everyone. It doesn't mean I won't be or wouldn't be, but I'm awake to the cause of it. So how is it possible? How, does this, you get this? Okay, that's, um, sometimes when I'm talking, I, I, I have, of course, I have no idea how people are hearing me, but I am clear about one thing we all, we, freedom is our birthright. And when we're not free, we're not kind. And then when we're not kind, we are guilty. We feel guilty, and it's a spiral. You know, it's an interesting analogy because the way you said that, because we talk about freedom and what stops us from being free, I think, sometimes is over a period of time, we lay brick by brick a pr the walls of a prison that stops us from then seeing. And you can't escape from the prison unless you have insight that you're in the prison, uh, I think. Um, you know. Can you give me your thoughts? Because all of us have a shadow that we sit with. And for some, uh, they hide the shadow and they're ashamed of it and they're embarrassed and they want nobody to know. But you can't be free until you sit with that and accept that as you and accept it as joyously as every other aspect, but maybe you could give us some insights into that. Well, you know, my way is to, um, to go, to look at that thing I don't want you to know about me. And then in your folders, you'll see what I call judge your neighbor worksheets. And those things that I did or said, or those of you I have hurt, you know, that come to mind, I identify what I think and believe about you, and I put those thoughts about you on paper. And then I question them, and that wakes me up to myself. And in that, and also um, the worksheets were so powerful for me because when I questioned them and turned them around because I wasn't identified, it showed me how to live in the world. Like, I want you to, um, I, want, I want you to stop hurting me. Maybe that's what I was thinking in a specific situation. And I want you to stop hurting me. Is it true? So contemplate that one. Are you sure? I mean, that would release a lot of identification. That's frightening to the ego, you understand? Yes, I wanted you to stop hurting me, but now I'm still in that. I want you to start hurting, stop hurting me. Is it true? Really? 
I mean, look at all the benefits of that. I mean, I get to be right, I get to be the hurt one, I get to be the victim, and you're the bad guy. I want you to stop hurting me. You know, you said something really terrible to me. And I want you to stop that. Is it true? Okay, so you contemplate it. You have no idea where you're going to go, but if you authentically want to know the truth, yours, not the world's, it's quite a journey. And then to notice how you react when you believe the thought. Notice how I react when I believe the thought, I want you to stop hurting me. In that situation, as I meditate, as I, as I med med meditate on then, now, I want you to stop hurting me. How do I react when I believe the thought? I begin to get in touch with those emotions. When I believe it, the emotions happen. I see the images of past future when I believe the thought. I see what was going on in that situation. The moment I witness my mind, I witness it. And then I can see every little facial ex expression and, and the, the stress and maybe my neck and shoulders and just sitting in yourself as you witness yourself in that situation in time with that person that hurt you. And then I see how I attack, how I become a victim and what that feels like. And I'm sitting there witnessing myself. I see, I see. And when I get a good look at that, and I feel complete in that, then I move to that last question, who would I be in that same situation without the thought, I want you to stop hurting me? Okay. Open, listening. And if you're being mean to me in that moment, where's my compassion for you? Feel what it feels like when you're mean to another human being, unkind. Feel what that feels like if you're mean to me, where is my compassion for you? There's something off if I'm not experiencing that. It's a state of understanding. It's a state of connection, Im immovable connection. And the availability to be there to listen and to help if there's any way that, if there's an opening for that with the wisdom to, under, to, to see an opening, if there is one, without having to create it, just present. And so with the thought, I'm a maniac. And that doesn't mean the thought's not going to be there. It means I was believing the thought. Believing the thought, I attack, I become a victim. Without the thought, compassionate, present. I want you to stop being mean to me, and then I turn it around. I want me to stop being mean to you. And because I've already witnessed myself that turned out not to be such a victim, because I've always already experienced myself, I can see I've got a lot of work to do. I have. I have things to admit. I have amends to make. I've got a life to make right with myself. And that would always include you if I have hurt you in any way. You know, one of the things that I think we forget sometimes is we create a vision of a memory that is filled with emotional content, but we think that that's a picture that it's an actual, true, complete photograph, yet it doesn't take into account the other people who were in the picture. And I think that's where we get lost, because we want to see our picture. And I think that's... Uh, it's, a it's a defense. It it's a way of defending our identity with all our might. You know, and, and that's... Um, <laughs> a lot of bodies in our lives, you know, um, <laughs> affected. When I, I, I love to say defense is the first act of war. 
So I, um, that's a wonderful thing to, um, to play with as you leave here. And in fact, it, that's a wonderful analogy because many of us, again, we have an event occur and somebody comes on to us aggressively mm -hmm. and we immediately defend. And therein lies part of the problem because many of the actions in, or the interactions we have or we sense this are not real. They're the manufacture within us that creates, again, that yeah. picture. And that's where we get lost. Yeah. And that's the defense of self versus, I think, what you were saying, this idea of no self. Because if there's no self, there's nothing uh, to defend. Um, what we're going to do is to do an exercise uh, with Katie. And uh, I think uh, it'll be a wonderful experience to also have a little bit more clarity. And I know many of you know Katie's work and have done some of the work, but we're going to do a little exercise uh, tonight, if that's okay Good. with you. Yes. So let's do it. So I invite everyone to close your eyes. Mrs. Close Doty, eye, could I get a book there, that pamphlet? The, the, yes. And get in. comfortable. And recall a situation, maybe um, someone said something to you that, that was unkind. Maybe they accused you of something you didn't do, blamed you for something. Maybe it's an argument. Maybe you're arguing over that. So, Look at that person that, that hurt you and begin to anchor in that situation. For example, are you in the kitchen? Are you in a car with that person in that situation where they hurt you? Maybe you're texting. Now get in touch with the emotions, get in touch with the hurt or the anger, the emotion. And name it, see if you can name it. Is it rage, is it hurt, is it anger? Now, why are you angry? I'll use the word angry. Why are you angry at that person? What did they say or do that hurt you? For some of you who are meditators, it may be a little easier than for some of you who are not meditators. For some of us, we have to get very still to be there now and identify why we're angry with that person. So with your eyes closed, those of you who are in touch with why you're angry at that person in that argument, raise your hand and then lower it. Okay. Now I invite you to open your eyes and fill in statement one on the judge and neighbor worksheet. You're in touch with the emotion. You know who that person was and you know why you were angry with that person. So just fill in statement one. I'm angry with Paul. I'm furious at Paul 
because he doesn't listen to me. And I'm standing in the kitchen 35 years ago, and I see it clearly. I see him there standing at the counter. I see me there. I can see where the kitchen sink is. I'm anchored in that situation, that time and place. And notice how some of you, your ego does not, not happy about allowing you to write it down. You want to shift it, change it a little. And that's just you with you. No one looking at your paper, but you. Jim pointed that earlier, you know, we, 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 there are things about us we don't even want us to know. <laughs> so it does take courage. I don't call it the work for nothing. So close your eyes, be there now, anchored in that time and place, witnessing that person, witnessing you, meditating on that moment in time, begin to get in touch with what do you want from that person? In that time and place, what did you want from that person? What did you want them to say or do or be? It may seem crazy to you now, but it's so important to collect, identify what we were thinking and believing then because we're still believing. It, that was the cause of our suffering. It was the cause of our anger. I want to say that again. It's so important to get in touch with what you were thinking and believing then, those thoughts, because those thoughts were the cause of your anger, not the other person. So this is not a little thing we're doing here this evening. What did you want from that person? And when you're in touch with that, fill in statement two. And I invite you to open and soften and be gentle and just continue to witness. As I witness that me in my situation more than 30 years ago, I begin to experience compassion. I'm completely out of control. I see that. I'm angry, I'm furious. I'm cruel. I see both of us. So now I invite you, with your eyes closed, to contemplate, be there now, and consider, begin to identify, to get what you want from that person in that situation, what advice would you offer that person? How could they give that to you? They should, they shouldn't. And we're in, when you're in touch with it, advice you would offer that person as you witness, when you're in touch with that, fill in statement three. What, sweetheart? Are we giving advice to ourselves in that moment or the other person? The other person. They should, they shouldn't, what did, to get what I want. In that situation, what advice would I offer that person? They should, or maybe they shouldn't. For example, Paul should. For example, Paul should stop overriding me. Listen. 
be more aware. That would give me what I want. That's the advice I would have for him. And if you ask me in 10 minutes and I meditate on it, it might change. So there's no right or wrong to this. This is, this is simply about becoming still enough to identify the thoughts that were causing your suffering in that situation. So now, with your eyes closed, what do you need to move from the emotions you were experiencing in that situation? For me, it was like rage. To go from rage to happy. Just that emotion, from that emotion to happy. Okay, what do you need to be happy? What do you need from that person in that situation and time? And when you've identified that, fill in statement four. So stay anchored, be there now. and begin to identify the thoughts you were thinking about that person at that time. Paul is cruel. He doesn't care about me. He's uncaring. Give words, give expression to what you were thinking about that person in that time and place, in that situation. And if you were angry, don't be surprised if what you write down seems crazy, because we are crazy when we're angry. It's just another, anger is another word for crazy. It's war. War is crazy. Now, for the last one, what is it about that person or that situation you never want to experience again? And when you're in touch with that, when you identify that, be there now, identify it, and fill in statement six. So filling in this worksheet, what did you become aware of? Just filling in this worksheet is incredibly powerful and we haven't even we haven't begun to question what we were believing then yet what did you realize as you were filling in your worksheet anyone so um, yes So you notice that you were uh, that you were assuming a lot about what you thought they were thinking. Yeah, that I know mind. Yeah. Yes. If you just stand and and just speak loudly. I wanted to be loved. You wanted to be loved. 
you know, we're doing war with someone because we want to be loved. <laughs> it makes perfect sense to those of us filling in a worksheet. There's another hand over Thank here. Maybe we can use the microphone because I think some people aren't hearing everything. Mm. And I want to see you run. <laughs> uh, the emotion that I was feeling in the situation about the other person was actually emotion I was feeling about myself. So the anger, the rage, the hurt was actually, if I flipped that, was actually self-directed and probably more of that I brought onto that person uh, than them bringing onto me. Wow. Yeah. You know, if I'm upset, I look to me. Because if I look anywhere else, I'm looking the wrong direction. If there is a, if there is a problem in, in our home, I look to me. Yes. Um, I notice that although this happened 40 years ago and he's dead now, I'm still pissed off about it. And Absolutely. You know, dead or alive, they can't get away from it. <laughs> so, sweetheart, would you like to stand at the microphone and share with us um, the, the first thing you wrote? Yes. You know, just because people die doesn't mean we don't still resent them. <laughs> yeah. um, I'm outraged with my so, dad. So, to the microphone. Oh, sorry. I'm outraged with dad because he made me feel so stupid and unloved. Okay, so your dad made you feel stupid and unloved. Yes. Again? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. Your dad made you feel stupid and unloved. Mm -hmm. Is it true? So everyone contemplate that. How many of you have experienced that, that someone made you feel stupid and unloved? Would you raise your hand? It's popular. <laughs> 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 there are no new stressful thoughts. <laughs> Stephen translated um, on, a, on a, a book called Gilgamesh. That it is the oldest one. It, it's written on stone. It was chiseled in stone. Same concepts <laughs> that we're dealing with today. That's how ancient, that's what an ancient world we're living in. We're so deceived by our clothes and our, and our things and, and same, oh, same, oh. It ends in you or it doesn't end. So he made you feel stupid and unloved. Yes. Everyone here that raised your hand and even if you didn't, meditate on this. Go back to the situation where he made you feel stupid and loved and unloved. Close your eyes. Your father made you feel stupid and unloved. He made you feel that way. Is it true? Now the answer in this practice, the first two questions, is one syllable. It's either yes or no. So for you meditators, this, you know, anyone that filled in the worksheet is now a meditator. <laughs> So he made you feel stupid and unloved. So now, being anchored there in that time and place, you don't have to guess, is it true or is it not? You're going to witness the images that are shown to you from that experience. And there's your answer. So you just contemplate it. And yes, you believed it when you wrote it. You believed it for four years, so let's go back, because it's safe to do that from here now, and see, did he really make me, did he really make me feel stupid and unloved? And just see what you see. No reason to manipulate what you saw then. See it from here now. So you, if you stay there, what did you see? Did you, as, as you witnessed that situation, 
He made you feel stupid and unloved. Is it true? No. So now just feel that ego doesn't like losing. That is its identity. I am the one that he, I am the one made to feel stupid and unloved. It's my identity. Question that, who am I? So now notice, sweetheart, witness how you reacted toward your father when you believed the thought he made you feel stupid and unloved. And all of you, I invite you to do the same. Witness how you treated that person and how it felt. Witness your life in that situation and moving forward with your father when you believe the thought. How do you react in that situation when you believe that he made you feel stupid and unloved? Do you want me to answer? Mm -hmm. What do you see? Oh. What do you witness? I see red. I see if I could have gotten away with it, I would have hit him. I would have screamed. I would have called him horrible names. Yeah. And how did you react? I did all of that silently within. Yes, and feel that. Now, close your eyes again, everyone invited, and witness who or what would you be in that same situation, witness who you are without the thought he made me feel stupid and unloved. And again, this is where, you know, this is, this is, we're meditating on that. And don't, you know, open your heart to compassion. It's easy from here. As you witness. And get connected. Who or what would you be in that same situation without the thought that he made you feel stupid and unloved? And I feel so bad for him because I know he must have had a really bad drive up to get me. And he's just pissed. And it has nothing to do with me. Wow, so he's having a difficult time. It has nothing to do with you. Yeah. Wow. Okay, so dad made me feel stupid and unloved. And I'm moving a little quickly here. You can sit in that for a long time and just... Okay, so he made you feel stupid and unloved. How would you turn that around to an opposite? And these opposites, when you find an opposite, like, I made me feel, try that one. I made me feel stupid and unloved. Okay, so now these turnarounds, don't make a religion out of them. <laughs> they are there to contemplate, that's all. They're like a new pair of boots you buy and you try on. Just try it on. What does that mean to you as you, as you contemplate that situation, that moment in time? Turned around, I made me feel stupid and unloved. What comes to mind as you witness that? I told myself he, even, he doesn't even know who I am and that's terrible. Actually, it wasn't four years ago, it was 40 years ago. He doesn't know who I am because he got me mixed up with my sister. <laughs> um, I made myself feel stupid in love because I told myself if he thinks that, maybe he's right and my decision was wrong. Wow, okay. And you can continue to contemplate this and don't, don't be surprised if tomorrow morning in the shower, it's just because it can just keep going. This, um, so he made me feel stupid and unloved. So can you see another opposite? I made him. Yeah, I made him feel stupid and unloved 
because when I told him about my decision, he thought that I felt the way my sister did, so what he said back to me was he was trying to protect me from making a wrong decision, because it would have been very wrong for her. So I made him feel stupid and unloved. And I invite everyone, if you're following your own situation, I made him feel stupid and unloved. Look at your facial expression in that situation, the way you looked at him. You know, the way we, we give them the look. You know, it says, yeah, you're stupid, and we both know it. <laughs> and I don't love you, by the way. And it can be just the slightest, and I want you to know that slightest movement. The slightest thing. I made him feel stupid and unloved to be so in touch with that. The next time you're with someone and you feel that little piece of your face, even, or your neck doing that thing, it wakes you up. Mm -hmm. To be that in touch with yourself. How many of you are uh, certified facilitators for the work in this room? Would you stand, please? And just wave. So, any, so if you want to work with one of these facilitators, be sure and, and finish your work. Also, on the work.com, we have facilitators 24-7 there. They don't ask your name. They don't ask where you come from. They're just there to support you to understand how to sit in this work. And it's free of charge. So. You know, it's a beautiful thing. Every time you do the work with one of these facilitators, they, at the same time, are experiencing the work themselves. So it's the circle. Um, yes, so questions? Yes, uh, so we have time for a few questions. Uh, why don't we go to the mic, if you don't mind, so everyone can appreciate what you say. It's right there. I wanted to ask about the first example you used, where um, you said that, uh, what did you say <laughs> about somebody wanted to, to, to hurt you and you wanted them to stop hurting you? What if that person would absolutely agree? You bet. I definitely wanted to hurt you. That was my objective. Now you're asking yourself, is it true? Well, apparently they're telling me it's true. So, uh, so still, if I am not connected, if I'm fearful in any way, that's a lack of compassion. If I'm defensive, then I need to look to me, because I cannot change another human being or what they're thinking and believing. But I can work with this, and inquiry allows me to do that, because my ego won't. Thank yeah. you. And you know also, if someone actually slapped me, it, it, it's like this, right? So where is the pain? It's in the remembering. It's in the remembering. Right? I remember, and then I see the slap again, and it seems so real, but it is imagination. It's how the ego stays identified as a something. That doesn't make it right. For someone to, to it does, it's not right that someone slaps you, but that's on them. If I separate and I'm not experiencing compassion, then what use am I? And I, again, I don't call this a work for nothing. All pain is either remembered or anticipated. Here's what that person did. Now, if he knocks me clear to the ground, other than what I'm thinking and believing, where's the problem? And I realize for some of you, this is incredibly radical. It's like if I don't stand up and do something, if I don't suffer, if I don't attack, if I don't, 
it doesn't take a lot of courage just to be aware when you're able to call 911 take care of yourself if i slap you hurt you i hope you call 911 and have me put away because i can't stop myself why i'm believing my thoughts if you slap me if i believed about me what you believed about me i'd have to slap me too <laughs> no choice no choice so can you stop believing what you're believing and the moment you believe it, how many of you can do that? <laughs> Not so easy. So what are we guilty of? We're believers. We're believers. And this is the invitation to wake yourself up from the dream. And, you know, why would someone slap me? I'm very clear why they would do that. Any lack of compassion or fear that shows up pushes me to find another way. So if I'm not grateful in some way for every experience that seems out of order, again, I, I, I have to look to myself. I wasn't depressed for nothing. You know, it was rarely my fault. <laughs> <laughs> we have time yes. for one more question. Hi, um, so I'm a freshman at Stanford, so my question is a little bit angled towards younger people, but not necessarily. Um, not so much related to the activity we just did, but with ego and the self in general. I think one of the things I struggle with most thinking about it is that on the one hand, I, I do really want to let go of identification with the self, but on the other hand, I have to pick a major within the next two years and decide <laughs> so <laughs> where I'm one. going forward so, and so balancing. So pick one, sweetheart, and go for it. <laughs> you know, being awake doesn't mean being stupid. <laughs> Yeah, it's, 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 um, it's where you access wisdom. It's where you access, where your creative mind is free to flow. You know, past, future is all fake news. <laughs> While you're thinking, maybe we can get this other question here. Go ahead. And we'll come back to you if necessary. Hello? Yes. As someone who recently graduated college, I'm realizing that we're always all undecided all the time. So don't worry about it. I, when we were in college, it was OK to say I'm undecided. And then we graduate, and we're not allowed to be that. I'm just going to start being like, I'm 23, and I'm still undecided. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Yeah. Can, I a, can I ask a question? How many people in this room are still undecided? <laughs> <laughs> you know, if you determine to go left, the worst that can happen is what you're thinking and believing. If you determine to go right, the worst that can happen is what you're thinking and believing. And if you do nothing, the worst that can happen is what you're thinking and believing. Question. Other than that, where's the problem? <laughs> so go for it, sweetheart. Just go for it. And, and you might want to question anything that would stop you. Did you want to respond to that? Yeah, I guess, reflecting on what I said, I guess it's the idea of how do you build the self without identifying with the self? It's not and necessary. OK. I mean, me just sitting here between these two amazing giants, you know, it's, it's just not necessary. Did you ask your question, actually? No. Well, let's do it. Mm -hmm. OK. Uh, you mentioned that there's freedom in the present, which I also firmly believe, um, and that the past you know, is that depression, and the future is that anxiety, and that the peace comes from dwelling in the present. But I'm curious, how do we dwell in the present with others when the way that humans relate is the past and the future? 
like what are you doing, how was your weekend, where are you going, we often don't even relate to each other in the present. Well, you know, if you ask me my name, I would, I would say Byron Katie, and um, my birth certificate is Byron Kathleen, and uh, I would say Byron Katie because people rarely ask me, is it true? <laughs> so, you know, it's, an, it's, it's like how to be in this world as you wake up. Like, what were yeah. one of those questions? Like, that you just spoke to, what, was, what were one of the questions? How was your, week? how was your weekend? Okay, oh, so, yeah, past, yeah. so how was your week? Ask me how my weekend was. How was your weekend, Byron Katie? Okay, <laughs> it was great. Um, I, was, I was still on book tour and, and I met amazing people and um, had incredible experiences and how, what am I answering her out of? The image is in my head. It's just that I'm awake to them, that is not I. Did you see the woman on the weekend on book tour? I mean, is that imagination? Or isn't this as close as we're gonna get here at the beginning? <laughs> On that note, we must, I'm sorry we can't, I'm sorry, and I appreciate that, but uh, otherwise, none of you are gonna get your book signed, and I would like you all to, if you have a book. So for those who are having, would like their book signed, Dong, do they line up here? Outside, and again, thank you.